according to reports, now this is according, April 16th, 1984, you you denied service at a McDonald's restaurant. Now, again, this is going to be, I'm going to read off what I've read, and then I want to hear your real story because I don't think all this is 100% true. Um, okay. McDonald's restaurant, according to story, you're angry. You threw a rock through a window, and but you claimed that the employee threw the rock, and but you received blame for this as well. Um, and you're there with a wrestler. You assaulted police officers. They came to your hotel. There's a fight. People are injured. You're eventually arrested and you're sentenced to jail for prison for two years. Yet this is the first time your first offense ever. But yet a heavy hand comes down two years in prison. So explain to me actually what happened that night and how ridiculous it is to give someone two years for the first offense. Yeah, well, politics. There are politics in everything. The judge and district attorney, uh, the DA prosecuted the case against me and uh, 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 Masa Saito, J Japanese uh, wrestler from Japan. And so uh, for, for, I, for about a year and a half, we were trying to get the trial started while well, they'd block it and extend it. And every week in Waukesha, Wisconsin newspaper, there'd be a hit story on us. Every week. And, uh, you know, just denigrating us uh, like monsters from outer space that came down to their little town to beat up their police department. Well, uh, the way that started, we were in... Uh, Watertown, Wisconsin that night in a tag team match against Mad Dog Vashon and the Crusher. And uh, Mad Dog had hit Saito in the knee with a chair, with a steel folding chair. Yeah. Accidentally hit him too hard and, you know, really screwed up his knee up. He had, his fucking knee was like that. He couldn't walk. So anyway, we... Uh, and we were in Vern Gagne's uh, twin engine Navajo airplane. So after the match in Watertown, we got on the plane, flew over to Waukesha. We land, so uh, some people picked us up uh, from the hotel, and drove us up to the Holiday Inn. We get to the Holiday Inn and we start drinking in the bar, you know, th thinking that we we're gonna be able to order uh, room service or something, you know, food. Yeah. Well, they'd close the restaurant. So couldn't get any food at the motel. So I I asked the uh, bartender, uh, a girl, I said, is there any place to get food around here? She, oh, yeah, there's a McDonald's right at the bottom of the hill. They're, they're, they're open late. So I, I told Saito, you know, I said, well, by that time, we had left the bar because it was closed. We went to our room. I told Saeed, I said, your knee screwed up. I'll walk down there. We didn't have any transportation because we were flying. Right. So we get, I, I get down the uh, uh, McDonald's and I'm banging on the door because the door was locked. All the lights were on. There's a ton of people in there. But it was a TV crew, and they were shooting a commercial. And they had two platters there, big platters. Uh, must have been 50 quarter pounders on each platter. So I asked uh, the kid that came to the drive-up window. I had to walk around to the drive-up window. I said, uh, how much are the hamburgers? Uh, they're not for sale. I said, not for sale? What the fuck? He said, well, the, I said, those platters over there, they're loaded with hamburgers. Well, those are for a, a TV commercial that we're shooting. I said, oh, that's why the, the cameras and all the people in there, is, and the uh, guy said, yeah, they're all employees. So I said, okay. Uh, I said, what's it going to take? I, I, I'll give you 50 bucks for four hamburgers. And uh, no, I can't sell them. 
I said, he said they're over an hour old anyway, so uh, it'd be against the, the law to sell them to I said, holy shit. I said, is there any place else around here to get a hamburger? No, nope, everything's closed. Yeah, but this time it's 1230. So anyway, uh, at that time, I'm at the drive up window standing outside. It was winter time. This kid comes up and throws up, and there's a rock garden around the uh, perimeter of uh, McDonald's. So he picks up a good sized boulder, I don't know, 25, 30 pounds, and he picks it up and he, boom, he throws it through the fucking side window, uh, the drive up window, knocks it out. And the, the kid, I saw him, the kid that was waiting on me, he ducked and ran ran back in the restaurant. And I said, fuck. So I just turned around to go back up to the Holiday Inn. And I looked at that kid, he was about 18, 19 years old. I said, why in the hell did you throw that rock through the window? He says, those assholes, fuck them. He said, they fired me, fired me last week. I says, well, what, you have a bad attitude? No, it was just so one of the uh, managers didn't like me and he fired me. I said, so that enabled you to get pissed off enough to throw a rock through their window. Anyway, I got blamed for it. So about a half an hour after that happened, I'm in my room talking to my wife on the phone uh, about 12.30 at night, and the cops are banging on the door. I said, Saito, see, see who that is. And I thought it was just some other wrestlers because there was about eight or nine of us staying there. He opens up the door, and there's two fucking cops standing out there in the hallway. Uh, is Ken Patera here? Because the, the kid that waited on me at McDonald's, he says, you're Ken Patera, aren't you? I says, yeah, I'm hungry. I need some hamburgers. And uh, so, so Sa Saito understood English real good, but he didn't speak a lot of it. Be besides, he was a bashful type guy. So anyway, uh, I, I, I hear him going back and forth. And so uh, I get off the, I told my wife, I said, I, I'm going to hang up and uh, told her what was going on at the door. I said, I'll call you back in a little bit. So I go up to the door and the cops say, we want to come in and search your room. I said, for what? I, I didn't do anything. I didn't, uh, you know, thinking that they I stole something or whatever. I don't know what the hell they were thinking right. what they were going to find. So anyway, uh, I uh, they're out in the hallway. They want to come in now. I said, "Well, fuck. Do you have a search warrant? No, we don't need a search warrant." I said, "Yes, you do." And uh, anyway, I don't know how. But anyway, uh, Saida wound up out in the hallway, you know, with the two cops. I'm still in the room. And all of a sudden, the, and there's a, a guy cop and a girl cop. This girl cop turns out to be 19 years old, uh, about 5'9", uh, skinny as a rail, looked like Popeye's uh, girlfriend, olive oil. And uh, so she pulls out the... Uh, Mace, and I don't see this because Saito's sit in between us. She goes like this, Saito ducks, and she hits me right in the eyes. I didn't have my glasses on. I left them on the nightstand when I was talking to my wife. So anyway, I'm fucking blind now. I'd never been Mace before in my life. And uh, so uh, Saito ducks. I get it into the face now. I'm fucking pissed pissed and uh i'm starving uh i'm a little drunk not not real drunk but anyway all shit breaks loose in the hallway and uh 
I, uh, we had the two cops down on the carpet and the, the hallway was only like four feet wide, mm. you know, very narrow hallway. Next thing I know, there's 16 cops on top of us with billy clubs, guns, you know, the whole nine yards. Yeah. You know, it was a fucking setup. Yeah, you know, how in the hell did 16 cops get down there to back up two cops? Right. Yeah. So anyway, we wound up, we stacked them up like uh, kindling wood. I mean, we fucked, we fucked them up. Because they're beating on us, you know. And if they hadn't started beating on us, nothing would have happened. Right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we uh, uh, after oh, I don't know three four minutes, uh, the guy that knocked on our door he pulls his gun out and he, you know, he fucking shaking like a lid. And his name was John Dillinger. You know, for, for uh, is that name right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, he was a famous gangster from back in the 30s. Yeah. I thought I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> his name was John Dillinger, of all things. So, anyway, I said, put your gun away. He said, yeah, I'm going to fucking blow you away. Uh, so, anyway, uh, we let him put the handcuffs on us and take us out of the motel and have fucking cops laying all over the place. And uh, well, they they started it, you know, what the fuck. And so anyway, we went to the county jail there in Waukesha, Wisconsin. The next morning, we bailed ourselves out. It was a ridiculous bail. Like uh, back in those days, like $150,000 bail. You know, fuck. But, uh, oh, and, and then uh, the newspaper report and the radio and TV stations, they were all there the next day, you know. So anyway, I had, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, may, maybe I had been on the road for a week. And back in those days, we always get paid after the show, whether uh, mainly cash. I had like $25,000 in my fanny pack. So then they accused me of selling drugs. You know, nobody could make this kind of money wrestling. You got to be selling drugs. I didn't fucking sell a drug in my life. So so anyway, I, I had the cash uh, to uh, bail us out. And uh, anyway, uh, then we... we we had to get lawyers and everything. And finally, a court date was set. And uh, we were we were entitled to a, a quick and speedy trial. They postponed it for over about a year and three months. And that way, they were able to build a case against these two uh, mean uh, uh, monster wrestlers. And uh, we went to court. We didn't have a fucking chance. I mean, we had good lawyers, but they. So then whatever happened to that McDonald's employee who threw the rock through the window initially? He was the mystery man. Yeah, they they didn't. They, they said they didn't know who it was. They knew who it was, you know, but uh, they, they never contacted him. And uh, so he just skated. Wow. And we we took the blame, and uh, so anyway, uh, a typical sentence for that type of offense was uh, thirty days in jail and a two hundred dollar fine. We got a fifty dollar fine and two years in jail for that bullshit. And so, talk about a railroad job. So I hired an attorney uh, to appeal it. At first, the appellate court wouldn't even take the case. While you're only uh, getting two years, you'll be out in a year and a half. Uh, uh, so they denied me uh, uh, bail on the appeal. So now I'm sitting in fucking prison. And finally, uh, my lawyer shows up 
And he looks at that. He said, this is bullshit, Ken. He says, uh, that, that other lawyer that represented you, that defended you, uh, is a cokehead. I said, what? Yeah, he's a drug addict. And the judge and DA knew that. So they used that, that bullshit against you and the cops and Saito. And so the whole thing was just a fuck job. So uh, I paid 75000 to uh, have the appeal. And of course, the, the judge, the DA, and the appellate court thumbs down. So now I, I have to, and this is after about six months. So I have to spend another year in that fucking stinking uh, prison. And um, not, so that, that, that's the true story. Right. I, I feel, and I feel like I bring up that this McDonald, this, the mystery man here clearly in my brain connected to somebody. Because the the uh, initial reaction of a rock being thrown through a window, there's clearly other people visually seeing this happen because of the shoot going on inside the McDonald's restaurant. So obviously there are more eyeballs or witnesses, but maybe, just maybe, that employee outside who got laid off knew someone is the mayor's son type of deal where like we can't let that guy get in trouble because we need he's he's part of our society. Let's take down these big mean wrestlers. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, the female cop that was involved in that, uh, her father was in the same courthouse with the police department, the judges, and the DA in Waukesha. It was a small town. Everything was consolidated. Yeah. So her father was a head coroner uh, there in the same building, and he was asshole buddies with that judge for like 40 years. Okay. And so it was uh, everything was connected, boom. And we didn't have any connections or anything uh, in that uh, town. Uh, I did have a senator from uh, Minnesota call over there and put a good word in for me. And uh, no, it wasn't Jesse Ventura. He was governor. <laughs> I say I think he was governed in the year two thousand as well, so yeah, it might have been right. a few, might have been a few years, a few years yeah, uh, a yeah. difference. Yeah, twenty years after the fact. Wow. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> Jesse came to my uh, birthday party back in November, and uh, him and Jimmy Brunzel they drove up from the. City. I live a hundred miles north of uh, uh, Minneapolis now. I oh, live wow. here in God's country. <laughs> uh, Piles of snow outside and everything. Yeah, people don't. Anyway, people... yeah, they, they drove up and uh, uh, Jesse had just purchased a, a new uh, electric car, a Tesla. Oh, yeah. I would I wouldn't expect him to be someone who's driving around in a Tesla. Well, he always drove Porsches. He he had two Porsches, sold them both. Yeah, you know, one for his wife and one for him, and he bought new Teslas. Wow. And I, uh, yeah, he says, Kenny, you got to get one of these. He says, well, fuck, I don't know. I I don't even drive anymore, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> just just buy one. You should just have it and sit in your garage. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you something. When I, the, this house now I, I built, and it's a big house. It's about 6,000 square feet. And the reason it's so big and I, I live by myself. My daughter and her family live on the east end of it. I live on the west end. And there's a, a, a big garage where uh, a workshop in the middle. And then she has a, she's a potter. So she has a pottery store. Oh, nice. Off to, and then she has a little store that's open to the public. And then, you know, they, they got four or five bedrooms, a couple bathrooms. It, and then she has this one area right off the uh, great room, uh, I don't know, 15, 16 foot ceilings. And she's got a big built in hot tub Ooh. Uh, in there with, I don't know, 10, 12 jets. You know? That sounds and pretty she, good. Yeah. And she's kind of like a horticulturist, too. I think she's uh, growing marijuana in there. 
Uh, no. <laughs> just it's legal where I am. You can buy 12 plants if you want to. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's legal here. Oh, man. yeah. I, I was going to say, I don't, I don't study each state's laws on legalizing of marijuana, but I certainly am aware of the state I am in. And uh, yeah. two thumbs up. Two thumbs up to uh, the, gov the government here at Massachusetts for pulling that off because it was a sad day. But though, uh, though you were brought back to the WWF after you got out of prison, uh, and they made a whole, they made a whole uh, VHS tape about it, had a whole story about it, bringing you back the story, and even having debates with Bobby Heenan on TV, bringing up exactly what happened to you. How does this happen? Who reaches out to who? And are you comfortable with this story being brought not just on local television? This is on national TV now. Yeah, well, Vince was uh, sending me money or sending my wife money every month. For two, when, the, when you were in prison this whole the, the, the two years? Yeah, yeah for 18 wow. months. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you know, I don't have, I went from making, you know, 35, 40,000 a month to nothing right and so now she's cut off and uh so uh i talked to him uh from prison and uh he said don't worry kid i'll take care of her and the kids you know so he had his accountant send her a check every month i don't even remember how much it was and you know it, it added up though and uh so when I got out of prison a year and a half later, uh, he called me and says, Ken, we don't have a place for what I want to do with you. But we don't have a place right now. Can you wait? Now, I got out in December. Can you wait until April, I believe it was? I said, yeah. Yeah, no problem. You know, when, when the time's right. And so we... Uh, uh, got everything, and he flew me back there to Connecticut to his new mansion, and um, we had a nice talk in the kitchen, and uh, Linda was there, and uh, the kids were upstairs. Uh, they, they were little then. I don't, the shame was God, I don't remember. 10. Well, yeah, because this was like 80 87 ish so uh, yeah they must have been very very young yeah, 87 and uh so uh stephanie was even younger maybe you know yeah. six seven years old so vince takes me on the house tour it was a fucking huge house indoor swimming pool and he had the the gym in there big gym and uh so it was a beautiful place. So, uh, and that was before he was a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so anyway, business was doing well, I guess. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that was before he uh, took over the old AWA and uh, uh, where I started in 72. You know, right after the Olympic Games uh, in Munich, uh, Germany. So, yeah. And uh, so we had it all set up. And I chat with uh, Vince and um, I'm going to start back in uh, April, May, something like that, whenever it happens. So that's what happened. Yeah. Wow. 